Hello and welcome back to the Start a Glamping Business podcast. Uh, you may be aware of today's guest if you follow the American Glamping Association or you went to uh, the glamping show in Colorado. Um, she's very active in the glamping community and for good reason because she's got an absolutely beautiful glamping site and she gives lots of great advice. So today's guest is uh, Irene Wood from uh, the fields of Michigan in South Haven, uh, Michigan. Uh, Irene, welcome to the show. Please just give us a bit of an introduction to, to the Fields of Michigan. Wow, thank you. It's always good to be on these shows. And again, just a larger audience and really just to find a kindred spirit in sufferance. I'll just use <laughs> it as an example because, you know, as you know, when you start a glamping business, particularly because there's not a playbook and there's not a ton of ways to do it, um, you're really a pioneer in your area, with your product, with your experience. And so you're you're in good hands, or I, I would say you're in spirit with me today, um, and I feel you and I see you. So, um, just as a little introduction went, I'm Irene Wood. I started a glamping business in South Haven, Michigan, six years ago. It'll be, which is unbelievable. It went by so fast, and um, I started it because I had just the most incredible experience doing this, and then it became my new way of travel. And then I looked at the market and I wanted to do it somewhere in my market and I typed it in and I used this story that my husband was like, we should do this with the kids, um, find something that's near us. And so, you know, Google is this incredible tool that's much more sophisticated than any of us here on the phone. And I typed it in and I said, glamping near me and there was nothing. And then I was like glamping and there was nothing within really a six hour drive. And I thought, how could this be? Like somebody would have discovered this before me. I mean, I can't be hot on the trot. I can't be the first one to figure it out, to do it in this area. And really that was the precipice of the field. It was first, I had experienced glamping. It became my new way of travel. I loved that um, immersive in nature, but still feeling like you're in a hotel. So you get the best of both worlds, like the thunderstorm, the snowstorm, the um, the animal, the all the fun intricacies that you get from staying outdoors but then there wasn't anything nearby and I wanted to serve that market. Mm -hmm. And so what, what kind of units have you got on site? What kind of amenities, who's it aimed at, et cetera? Yeah. So, you know, I'll start with kind of just the natural progression. So I always tell everybody when they're really starting a glamping business is the biggest part of the word, which is business. It's a long word. It carries a lot of meaning and it doesn't necessarily mean the glam part. Um, so I really structured the business in a way that I would provide accommodations that I could afford, deliver on that product, find different ways of reinvesting in the business over a course of a time, enhancing the product based on customer feedback, based on team feedback, and then really deciding what my term for glamping was. So I'll define all of that. So when I started, I had safari tents. All of the safari tents did have bathrooms. So that was a non-negotiable for me. And, and part of the reason it was a non-negotiable is I'm a suffering uh, or recovering camper. So I had children who were in Boy Scouts. And if you know anything about Boy Scouts, they stick you in the middle of the woods, in the middle of a forest. And you are what feels like 10 miles away from the nearest restroom. And every you know night I would have to go to the bathroom and I'd put the little lamp on my head and I would walk through the woods and I was terrified to lift the light of the lamp up because then I would see all the animals staring back at me. So I said, I'm going to problem solve that out. Nobody's going to have to feel like they're in the outdoors because we're going to make sure the bathroom is on the indoors. So we started with safari tents with bathrooms on the indoors and that was the largest investment. And then figured if we had that product and we did that really well, it would make sense for us to then start to add on some revenue generating enhancements to the property that would then allow us to reinvest in the product and then develop our own. So six years later, which again, it's like it's taken us this long after six summers and six falls and six winters and six springs, we said, all right, what is, has been our nightmares and how do we engineer them out? Um, and so we've developed another product that feels that's individual to us. So if you ever saw it in Kansas, the UK, you would go, that's the fields product. It's like getaway has one, you know, auto camp has one. And, um, and then 
what we did was we were, were migrating to that. So then our property will have the OG tents, the tents where everybody's kind of accustomed to seeing with that term glamping, Mm -hmm. but then we're transitioning it and saying that the glamping part isn't necessarily the tent or the product. It's actually the service and the luxury of service in the outdoors, which is really complex for anybody who's an operator. Yeah. And it's, it's that, it's that, that move towards experiential hospitality that is, is so popular and, and, and particularly with millennials and is such a growing trend. So do you, do you expect to one day go, uh, cause, cause uh, when you're talking about these new products, are you talking about the, the new kind of range of units that you've just recently announced? Yeah. So the range, the new units and the new units were, um, and I, I, if Maud was listening, she'll know exactly. And it's, I do this affectionately. So Maud was a guest that we had this past year and she shows up in these incredibly darling, cute Chanel rain boots. Okay. And it's fall. It's actually Halloween weekend. The leaves are as beautiful as you can imagine. The air is incredibly crisp and it smells of fall, but we have this bug and it's a, called a stink bug. I don't know if you have them in the UK, but they just, no, I don't they, think so. they're, um, they're harmless, but they get into your homes and you could have them, you could lock up a Yeti cooler and somehow one would still get in there. <laughs> so we, we sweep and they sit really between the screen and the canvas and she's French. Um, and she's like the bugs, the bugs. I cannot, I cannot. And I'm, I'm not doing her French accent any justice. And, um, she happens to be walking by a teammate and she's going through like this, like, you know, like the bugs. And again, they're outside. They're not inside. And she's telling me she cannot handle it and she has to leave. And, um, luckily we had the ability to be able to do that for her. We had another property which has, you know, air conditioning and closed, it was like a hotel that we could put her in. But I remember thinking that there is somebody who wants to see the outdoors but doesn't want to be in the outdoors. And so um, with this product, what we've said is you're going to have all the luxuries of what a luxury resort would have, you know, beautiful bathroom um, designed by, you know, the best interior designer, but you're going to have walls of windows. So you're just immersed, but you're conditioned is kind of the way I would use it. And that's just naturally um, as you develop your clientele, there's clientele who, when they hear the word glamping, it's something shifts in their mind that that makes them think it's actually not outdoors, but it actually 100% is. That's the whole reason you're doing it. So it's trying yeah. to meet that customer because there's a lot of those customers out there. Yeah, and, and that, that, that model is kind of being... Um, uh, uh, it's grown in popularity that there's, there's a few that are doing similar kind of models where it's kind of custom build hard wall units, but it is very much still in the outdoors. So you've got an era, um, Ben Wolf at an era in, in, in Texas, who we've had on the podcast, you've got yep. uh, Isaac French, uh, Live Oak Lake also in, in Texas. So I think he's just sold Live Oak Lake and, and that they have these kind of, as, as, as you described, kind of custom designed hard wall luxury units that also you know allow you to, to be in nature so are you moving is your plan to move the whole site towards that model or are you planning to keep the kind of more traditional safari tent glamping as well and, and have a bit of a hybrid you know i'm going to keep both and the reason mm-hmm. i am is um so as we look to the future and i start to you know i'm i feel like i'm immersed in the industry in a way that it's like I'm everybody's following this whole like Kate Middleton. Is she alive? Is she not alive? She, <laughs> like, like I'm catching up on what are the products out there? Um, who's doing them? What does it look like? What is the consumer talking about? And there is something, and I'm going to use a, a term like the OG, the original gangster, like the original <laughs> gangster of camping and glamping is actually the safari tent. And there's something so amazing about it. And even when we did the design of these cottages, we said we don't want to lose that feel, that feel of canvas that somehow naturally people think make them feel like they're camping. Um, and how do how are we going to incorporate it? So we'll maintain the accessibility of canvas because there is a following and even our own following is like, I don't want that cottage. I want to stay in like, I've stayed in tent. 10 for the last five years. I want 10, 10 still. So we're going to maintain that product and then enhance so that camp will have a little bit of both. Um, which also in my mind allows anybody who wants to be the fields of UK, 
we'll use that as an example to say, okay, we can't afford the build out of a cottage, but we can start with the tents. And the fields has a product of the tents. We can That can be our entry. And then we'll grow into cottages when we can start to afford them. Because again, that was some of the things like, and I'm not knocking the prefab industry, but it's really capital it's capital expensive. It's really hard to break into it. And then if this becomes your business, which again, setting aside the glamping word ahead of it, a business, when you're starting to do your financial models, it's like, what can you really afford? So that's yeah. part of it. So, but we'll always keep both because we can't, we have guests that just won't stay, they won't stay in a cottage. Hi everyone, Nick from Glamper Tech North America here, and I've just got a very quick message to announce some extremely exciting news. Since launching in July 2022, Glamper Tech North America has made a name for itself in the North American glamping industry. We've consulted on over 40 glamping projects, accumulated over 47,000 podcast downloads and plays, and we're now ready to take the next step. And with that, we're absolutely delighted to announce that we're beginning the process of developing our own glamping projects. We want you to be involved. There are more details to come, but for now, we're taking expressions of interest from prospective investors. We're so excited to get this going. It's been a long time coming and we can't wait to get you involved. So all you have to do is fill out the form in the description of this episode and we'll be in touch with more information very soon. We can't wait to hear from you and we'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. This is going a little bit off, off script, but I'm, I'm personally curious because we're, we're looking at, um, we've been looking at doing our own resort for a little while now. And one, one property that we've been looking at, we were considering maybe, okay, in the summer for a few years, we'll add a few, you know, lower end bell tents just to, to bolster the revenue and one of the, the, the considerations there was okay how do you mark stay marketing to you know 400 500 dollars a night luxury year-round units that's your bread and butter but also appeal to the you know 100 150 dollar uh, a night crowd with the, with the summer bell tent so have you have you thought much about and obviously the discrepancy between your units is, is a little bit less that because you've still got you know the lower end is, is the safari tents which are you know generally better than bell tents without bathrooms but have you thought about how you're going to market those in the, in the same kind of category at all yeah, so I think that the reason, so there's some identifiers and I'll say, um, I'll use my husband and I, an example. So when we went out West and we stayed in one of these, my husband left the, t the tent every day to go to the resort and shower. And I, I kept thinking to myself, like, what's the big deal? Just go shower in the back. He's like, it snowed last night. It's cold. Like the what? like, no, I'm going to go and spend four hours in a shower and lather up and sit in the sauna. And I thought we're the same traveler. So we can both enjoy same products. I have advised people that say, I, I'm going to just do bell tents and that's going to be our entry to market. I have advised that it's harder to move up in the food chain than it is to start at the top and then start to pick up um, clientele that might be aspirational to that. So we've this year added six primitives. And the reason we added six primitives was not because that's our market. We just have 25 year olds who are aspirational, who want to stay on the property, who recognize what the brand, not the branded, what the curated clientele looks like, want to be them, want to be in the room with them, can't afford it, but they still want that experience. Had we started there, it would have been very hard to convince somebody mod with Chanel shoes to show up and stay. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. I feel like it's easier to start at the top and add in a lower product than it is to start at a lower product and go, trust me, we're really great. Mm -hmm. You can trust us with a bell tent with a bathroom and now with a, you know, luxury cottage and a Michelin star chef. And you're like, mm. it's like the KOA. That's why the KOA then rebrand, not rebranded, created a whole new brand for their luxury line. Because it was going to be way too hard to convince people who were staying in tents to then move up and stay someplace else. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And, and I was particularly interested in, in when you said, you know, you, you, you offer maybe a, a more basic offering to 25 year olds who maybe don't have as much disposable income as 35, 40 year olds. And yep. they can see the you know, the, 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 up, the upper end that, that you're also offering and, and it's aspirational. It's quite similar to, uh, I read a book um, called Unreasonable Hospitality by um, a, a New York restauranteur and, and he, he he kind of did did the same principle where he, he made, I can't remember whether he was either offering cheaper lunches or something to tomorrow's CEOs. And, and it's kind of that where, where, where you bring these people into the business. Maybe they're not necessarily your 100% dream clientele today, but tomorrow they might be. And I, I think that's really smart. Yeah. And I think too, there is this part with, um, you know, there, 
there is this part where as everybody's business, and again, I, I feel like, well, like our Instagram makes it look like we're, um, it's just a photography maven <laughs> really behind the, behind the, behind the curtain, like literally like Wizard of Oz, there's, you know, financial spreadsheets and data analytics and understanding the consumer and then figuring out how you're going to add. So the other thing I would say with starting a glamping business is, you know, I was just having this conversation actually today was when we started the glamping business, 90% of our revenue, 92% of our revenue in year one was rooms. Then as we started to navigate through year one through now year we're going and we finished year five, we're going into year six rooms are 60%. Everything else is now in the 40. My goal is to get it to a 50, 50 split where that's where you're continuing to grow revenue in your business area. And there's a lot of really smart people out there and particularly Instagram has some of the best quips and it's not necessarily in glamping businesses. It's about entrepreneurism and starting any business, whether it's a shirt business, you know, that if you're investing in areas of revenue growth, and you're increasing the, in, in each one, you're elevating your product, you're doing what's best for your consumer. And so um, that's kind of the evolution of the business too. It's like, be okay to start here. Recognizing, absolutely understanding where you wanna be, and then just being laser focused on executing each year and then reflecting, did we do what we said we were gonna do? No differently than, you know, like it was like Kobe Bryant, you know, when he was talking about the reason he's better than everybody is he gets up and he works two hours longer than everybody. It's the same thing. It's like, this just isn't going to fall in your lap because Peppa the pig took pictures with it and went on a trip and you happen to see, you know, what's the Jennifer Gardner and that movie or show sit in a fun bell tent. This happens because somebody's actually working, delivering. So, you know, that's the other part too. Yeah, and, and and you know to to go back to the start, um, you you've kind of obviously everyone knows when you build a glamping business, you are getting into the construction business really, uh, yeah. and and then as you've you've made clear, you know you're also you're a businesswoman. You have to you're you're building a business. This isn't just some fun hobby, even though you know some people it might start out as that. But if you want to get to the levels that you're at, then you have to really kind of treat it seriously as a business and work on it like any other business. When you when you decided to 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 um, to build this glamping business in, in, in Michigan. Did you have any uh, development background and did you have any business background? Uh, if not, were you scared going into this? Kind of what, what was your what was your situation going into this and how have your skills developed as, as you've gone through the process? Yeah, so I would say yes, yes, and yes. I absolutely had no business experience. Zero, me, myself. Um, I have I have been groomed probably like every woman who wants to start a business in hospitality. I have been groomed from a child from since I was an infant into being a host with my little tea parties, with my princess dress and, and then having girlfriends over for your, you know, popcorn party, whatever it is. I think girls just naturally, um, just based on moms and lifestyle and media, we're just groomed to be warm and kind and let me take care of you and let me host you. So in that sense, I've been groomed to be in hospitality. From a business sense, I absolutely had zero. I didn't know words like P&L, balance sheet, performas, none of those things. And if you don't know, and I just said three words you don't know, probably don't start the business yet. Those are things that you have to you know, read about it, um, learn about it, talk to people, ask questions. So I didn't know about payroll, payroll taxes. I didn't know about... I mean, I knew payroll, but then I was like, I've just been receiving a check for the last 20 years. How did that all work? Like, what's that system look like? And so a reservation system, what do you mean that there's a credit card processing company that's your middleman? You know, like some of the other intricacies that come in. So I had no idea. So I started very blindly, but I would also tell you that was my gift because once I dove in the pool, I was like, got to swim to the other side. There's no option. And, um, and probably a lot like the people that may listen to this. Remember we talked about it goes in the cloud. Um, they're going to start with property that they likely own and that their home is on or near and nobody wants to lose that. So I think that, you know, to start it, it's, you have to be first be incredibly passionate about hospitality. And then second, you have to be really honest with yourself that is this a business or a hobby? And then that will start to make the decisions that line up with how big do you go? Um, and then the third thing is, is recognizing 
do you have it in your DNA to actually do it? It's like, I'm watching, I'm going to go back to Instagram, but I'm watching this guy who's running across the United States on Instagram. And he's like on day, do you know, do you, do you watch the same no, guy? No, I thought you were going to, I'm watching a guy who's running across the whole of Africa. Okay. <laughs> so we're watching similar guys. Yeah. And he's running 60 miles a day, 60, sometimes 70. And it takes him 12 hours a day. And his goal is he was trying to break a world record. And in day 10, he realized he wasn't. And everybody was mad. And they were like, just quit. What are you doing this for? And I thought, how many people could actually get up and even walk 60 miles a day, let alone run it, and then do it day after day after day? And so this is what I say to anybody who wants to start a business. Um, I, for some reason, I have, I don't, I can't run 60 miles a day. That's not my desire, but I can start a business. And that's my desire. So I have that hunger and that like something, that little switch that's probably a little off that says, you could tell me today, I mean, you need to start a floral shop and it has to be the most successful floral shop within a 30 mile radius. And I'm going to do it. I can do it. Mm -hmm. And I just know the levers to, to move now in order to do a business like that. Um, so it doesn't feel so far reaching, but I probably always had a switch off. Did you know you had that belief with you when you started or is that something that came out as you went through the process? No, I knew. And that was the interesting part. I knew, I didn't know, I knew hospitality. I worked as a restaurant. I worked in, um, you know, I've worked in restaurants growing up. I held a job, right? I, I was in, a, I did event planning. I just knew I have, I'm 45, just tell you, I have 45 years of history of saying, if I said I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And so it wasn't like, if I told myself, Lent is a great example. If I can't eat an Oreo for Lent, I'm not going to eat an Oreo. I don't, I don't even worry about it. I don't even have that voice in my head that says, go eat the Oreo, go eat. I'm not eating the Oreo. Similarly, if I say, if I've made the commitment that I'm going to start a business and that business is going to be profitable and I'm, it, I, and it, it just happens to be in this particular case, it was glamping. I knew I was going to do it mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how I have that. My husband's like, that is a trait that is so, um, not weird, unique. He goes, because most people go, Ooh, I don't know if I can do it. I, I can't like that feels overwhelming. Then you probably shouldn't. Yeah. And that, that's, that's, you know, having spoken to a lot of people, it's, you, you do have to be willing to just take the leap and not everyone has it innately i do think you know you, you can you can observe how other people do it and think okay right why can't i do it um yeah. but i think you know at the end of the day you do need to have that little bit of nerve and, and and ability to say well you know it might go wrong but but you know i'm gonna take the risk anyway uh and then when things do go wrong then you know being able to navigate them and pick yeah, yourself up for and, sure there is an yeah. answer right and mm -hmm. i there's an answer and i think maybe i was Fairly or unfairly, when I use the word groomed, I hope it comes across in a really kind of positive way. But I grew up as a farmer on a farm and, um, you know, I became an engineer. And I, I remember being in high school and being given a really difficult math problem and just kind of going like, I can't figure this out. I, I can't. And I thought, wait a minute, there is an answer to this problem. I just don't know it yet. And I don't have the tool to figure it out yet. So um, all I have to do is find the tool and that, so I, so there was a little shift there. Then I was, you know, in college and out of college and I was working at this really, um, as an engineer and I would go to this great Italian restaurant. It was like a hole in the wall. And I asked the woman, I said, how do you make such good food? And she was like, can you read? Like just so disgustingly. I'm like, of course I can read. She's like, then you can cook. And so I think that that was just pounded in. If you have the determination, you can do anything you want to. So again, for this podcast, if anybody has the determination, I really want to start a glamping business and I want it to be profitable, then you'll read about it. You'll dream about it. You'll ask tons of questions. You'll learn about all the intricacies of, of the business. You'll, you know, you'll talk to your state. You'll talk to all the governing bodies. You'll ask all the questions and you'll be relentless. And then you'll have the answers and you'll just start to go to work. Amazing. Amazing. So um, going on to, to the actual development, how, how was that for you in terms of figuring out how to design the site, how to get permits, how much to charge? How, how, how was that whole process for you? Um, do you really want to know? Yes. <laughs> it was a shit show. Like really a shit show. And here's the reality. Most people, it's like um, building a subdivision for tiny tents. 
excuse me, Cass, excuse me, Township, I would like to build a subdivision with tiny tents with bathrooms. And then I want to run it like a resort. And then all the governmental agencies are like, well, if you want to be a resort, then you have to have, you know, a suppression system. And if you want to be this, you have to do this. And if you want to be this, you have to do this. And I think when I would hit a roadblock, I would go, okay, who's the, who are the two entities that keep looking at each other going, she needs to make the decision. He needs to make the decision. Okay. We have to make the meeting. We're going to, and we're not leaving this room until the decision's made. Like we're, cause time is money and nobody knows that better than somebody that's trying to open up their business. Um, and uniquely, which lots of people will be the first, I was the first to do it in the state of Michigan. Actually, I was the first to do it in the Midwest. So the state was like, nobody's ever done this before. I don't even know what to call you. I don't even know how, like, who is the entity that would be governing you? How do you get your licenses? Where do we? So those were some of the challenges. And I think, um, again, kind of back to this resilience, I just said, I have to do it. I've made an investment. I have money at risk. I have land at risk. We just have to get moving. So, um, for those that are listening, I would always say the best person to help you is usually a civil engineer is to go to a civil engineer and say, I'd love to do this project. This is what I'm thinking. How do we, how do we do this? And then they say, all right, um, I have a really strong relationship with a township or a county and let me talk, let me call them and let me, let me call you back. And then they ask a few questions and then naturally just the cascading effect of putting together a decision tree of, if I, when this happens, I go to step two. If this doesn't happen, this is the next step that I have to do. And then I had a girlfriend who was like, she runs her own, her family's plastic, uh, global plastic company. And she's half my age. And she's, I just remember being in office. She's like, I wake up every morning. All I'm doing is laser focus. I'm just laser focused, Irene. And I kept thinking, Instead of me dilly dallying on Instagram and, you know, mm. walking around and eating a payday, I've got to get laser focused today. A decision needs to be made. And if that decision is a no, then what's the next two decisions that are options. And I think, um, so construction was full sewer, full water, full electricity for a vacant piece of land that didn't even have power brought to it. Um, so it was incredibly cumbersome. And then I'll look at even now, you know, we're adding a swimming pool. We have, um, nine cottages, those cottages are like nine tiny homes. That, that's another thing that's cumbersome. But I just show up and go, I can make it a burden or I can also look at it as an opportunity. And I think that that's a, we talk about business and people that are successful and not, it's, it's oftentimes a mental shift as well. Yeah. And it sounded like they tried to um, require that you, that you have pretty extreme um safety precautions with you know when you're trying to subdivide did you manage to tone them down a little bit and 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 or did you have to go the whole hog and and, and have you know everything in place this is the thing too i i mean there are are you are you fighting them for the sake of fighting them are you fighting them for the sake of winning are you fighting them because you actually think it's silly or are you fighting them because you can't afford it so those are the things that I think about when I'm passionate about something. And I think to myself, the easiest place to be is to be compliant. It's like when you speed and you're speeding down a highway and you go too fast and somebody pulls you over, um, but everybody else was going just as fast. Does that mean you don't deserve the ticket? No, you weren't compliant. Mm -hmm. Everybody was going fast, but that doesn't mean that you should have been going fast. So in every area where I felt like I was getting a little pushback, and I'll use, I'm not going to say fire safety, but fire safety is kind of one of them. Um, sewage, water, that's another one. And the reality is, is that there are governing bodies that are there to protect, not necessarily me, it's the consumer or a neighbor or a natural resource. And so I may be frustrated that we had to put in a sewer, you know, 500 yards from where I wanted to. But the reality was when the guy said, Irene, we have to protect the riverbed that flows into Lake Michigan because of fish. I'm like, I don't like it, but I understand it. And if he didn't tell me that, what would my gut check have been? Would I have cheated and cut a corner and, you know, run sewer into a river? I no, I hope not. But those entities are in place to protect somebody from not doing the right thing. 
and there being consequences a different day. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And, and moving on to, to the site itself, uh, I think your tagline is, is, is Midwest Hospitality Perfected. Yeah. Um, so what, what does Midwest hospitality mean to you and, and how is that encompassed at the field? Yeah. Um, kindness, warmth. Um, I just sent this over to a friend today. Top chef. Are you familiar with that show? Do you guys have that? No, I'm not. <laughs> okay. So top chef, they take all these chefs and it's a competition. Well, they happen to be in the Midwest and they were asking the chefs, you know, normally they film in New York, Chicago, not New York, but the coast, New York, California. And they said, what did you love about the Midwest? And she said, I loved the road trips and I loved the honor system. And I don't know if there's many places in the world that function on the honor system. And the honor system means so much, right? It means in expecting that, well, not expecting. It just means that I'm going to give you, I assume you're a great person and you assume I'm a great person. It means I treat you like you're my best friend and you treat me like you're my best friend. And it just has this level of warmth and depth that comes across in its service. And if you ask me for directions, instead of me kind of, you know, um, instead of me just kind of looking up and like, you can Google it. Like I can name some cities where people would say that New York, um, I think that we could, you know, we'd be like, oh my gosh, hop in the car. Let me show you where it's at. It's just that. We just assume everybody's our best friend in our family. And we, we always say when, kind of when we're going through the interview, it's like, well, do they have the skills? It's like, well, what's the number one skill to have for our, for our team? Warmth. And how do you define warmth? I don't know. I think people just exude it. And so that is such a hard quality to quantify and measure, but you just know when it's not there. So you know when it's there and you know when it's not there and Every uh, in a room of a hundred people, everybody would pick warmth, and everybody would say that's not warm. And so we look for warmth. I, I assume it's very rewarding to deliver that level of service as well. Um, that's why we do it every day, right? Yeah. Like again, innate. That's that's the only reason we do it. It's because it's somehow in the DNA. Can't I can't imagine it doing it any other way. And back to that chef you were referring to, I'm sure you listened to when he talks about the hot dog experience. Somebody was like, you know what? Mm -hmm. I really feel like I want a hot dog. And they run down the street and they go to the best hot dog stand and they bring the hot dog back and they put it on the plate and they style it with their fancy ketchup and mustard. And, and they didn't have to do that. They could have said, no, we don't have hot. Clearly we don't have hot dogs. Um, but it's innate in their DNA to meet the need of the customer and the need of the guest. And that's actually the best part of the job. Yeah, it's my Mike. I've got a little bit of a dream to do uh, to do unreasonable hospitality in glamping and, and intuitive yeah. stuff like that. But I think we've got to build build our way up there first. Um, <laughs> are, are you are you do, are you staff heavy? Do you have lots of staff running about the site, or or is it is it, is it you know laboring labor light? Like, what's the situation there? Um, I would say uh, staff perfect. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're high touch, so. You know, there's some business models that are very low touch getaway. I, you know, I have friends that are GMs at getaway and they said, you know, if we don't see a guest and we don't hear from a guest, it was a win. And I thought, oh my God, I'd be mortified if I didn't see my guests, check them in, see them, you know, uh, five times a day. And then they, they checked out and I didn't say goodbye and give them a hug. Like I, I that is not my model. So, um, our team's model is a very high touch model with multiple touch points throughout the day and just, you know, check in, check out morning, evening. Um, we have fire starters. We have these high school boys that come in and start fires for guests because that's, that's hard if you don't do it all the time. Hey, Glampatech listeners. This is Jacob from EJH Distribution with a quick message about our company. EJH Distribution is a premier provider of event structures, glamping accommodations, and much more. We're a distributor for many manufacturers, one of them being Dewar Tenton company that's been around for over 75 years. You may have seen some of their products at the glamping show the past couple years, one of them being the Oak. The Oak is a tunnel tent made of polycotton canvas with an aluminum frame. It sleeps between four to six guests and is perfect for a family unit on your campsite. We also offer other products like geodomes. These are also made of a breathable polycotton canvas with a large bay window and a beautiful front awning piece. One of our other premier manufacturers is Tubo Spain, which is a cylindrical, modular glamping accommodation. 
that provides 360 panoramic views and turnkey options. Perfect for places that have big open skies where you can enjoy night view. We also provide event structures from Creative Structures in the Netherlands, which offer unique dome structures which are modular and can be built in a matter of hours. Perfect for weddings, hosting spaces, and much more. If any of these products have piqued your interest, please feel free to reach out to us at sales at EJH Distribution or give us a ring at 587-987-0115. We'll be more than happy to help you with your project. There will also be a link to our brochure, our virtual showroom, and much more in the description below. Thank you for your time and hope you enjoy the rest of the show. You mentioned that, that you have kind of 40% of your revenue is is from non-accommodation. Uh, could you just give us a bit of information as to, as to you know, where that money comes from, that 40% and, and how it's, you know, the effect it's had on your business? Yeah, so I think I'll just tell everybody here, the easiest way to do it is to partner. We'll start that. That's no labor. You know, you're, you find, I'll use Michigan as an example. We find a captain that we love. Um, we have the captain he's our sole captain. And we say every guest that wants to do a sunset sale, we'll send them to you. And then we get a percentage of that because that's a customer that otherwise wouldn't find you. Right. So that's an easy one. Or, um, we're going to send you to a winery. You're going to do a wine tasting. Um, that could be a different one. So I always say the easiest way to increase revenue without additional staffing and cost is to find partners. Then the next one is to say, wait year one, year two, and then go, what are your guests asking for? Like, oh man, it would be really great if we had, if we could get a couple's massage. Do you know of anybody in the neighborhood who could do a couple's massage? Or it would be really awesome if we could, there's no food around here. Could we have like a, if you had a picnic to go and we were able to go down to the beach with a picnic, we could do that. That's offsite catering brought in that can handle all that. Then it's, all right, now we've got till year two, we can see what some of the demands are. And then you can start to either contract that or bring that in-house. And then maybe even if it from a staffing situation that your massage therapist was only being used two of the eight hours of a, let's just use a shift, maybe you're able to use them in a different capacity. Um, and I don't want to use the word babysitting camp, but maybe they come in in the morning and make coffee. Maybe they bring out the muffins. Maybe they walk from camp to camp. Maybe they can help offload some of the natural tasks that just take place on a piece of property that is of acreage. I mean, we have 30 acres and you're, you have multifaceted teammates who can do multiple roles. And so you're able to give them a full day without trying to go, we only need you for the two. Thank you so much. See you later. You won't be able to retain talent that way. You mentioned um, how you have conversations with guests, which leads to adding on elements and improving the business. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's pretty, pretty obvious that when you're opening a site on day one, it shouldn't look, it should be a lot better on day 365 than it was on day one. You've got to improve it and, and observe. Where, where did most of those conversations come with, with the guests? Was it after the stay? Was it when you were, you know, on one of those touch points during the stay that you were talking about and, and how did you kind of tease tease that kind of feedback out you know it's i would say during the stay and um so during the stay you can get the most not the most honest feedback i think you'll get a a lot of people will provide feedback during the stay if you're asking questions like it was so glad i was so glad that you guys came this weekend it looked like you had a lot of fun um what i know it was raining on saturday i was we brought you over some cookies gosh, was there anything else like that we could have done that would have filled that time for you a little bit better? And they're like, we were just laying in bed and thinking, God, wouldn't it have been great to get a massage? And in my mind, I'm like, oh my gosh, massage, two massages. Think of the actual revenue generation that would have occurred on a rainy <laughs> day where otherwise you're not able to do some of those things. Or listen, we, um, we, we've been to this area and we know that you guys, there's a bunch of wine. Is there any good Michigan wines? And it was like, oh, what if we did a Michigan wine tasting at, you know, by a sommelier who comes on site and, and does that? Would that be a service people would engage in? What does that price point look like? Let me look at it. What would it cost if they actually went on a trolley and went to all these wines? As long as we're less than that and we're giving them the same experience and we make it prettier, put tablecloth down and some candles or can we capture that revenue instead of giving it to somebody else? So that's kind of how that evolves. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and onto, the, onto marketing, you have, I think, 30,000 Instagram followers, which is pretty good for a glamping business. Um, 
what's your strategy? Because it, 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 you said earlier, it's like almost like a almost like a kind of photography album. It, it, it's a, you know the property is beautiful. There's so many colors, flowers. Um, so presumably you go pretty um, pretty high end on 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 the, the you know the marketing strategy. So so what is what is your kind of strategy for that? Um, I never want somebody to think that what they saw on Instagram wasn't representative of their experience. So if somebody calls, and I'll use you as an example, if you said, hey, your Instagram looks great, I'm like, go look at my tagged photos. Tagged photos are photos that somebody else has taken to promote the business or promote their experience, not my photos that have been selected and maybe taken by a um, photographer who was there for a wedding or an event, and I just am reusing their photos. Um, But I also, and I know I'm wrong, so because there's a whole business out there that's generating income from Instagram. But my thought behind it was I was going to just have a following that wanted to be our field family. They were guests of ours. They were aspirational guests of ours that love us because they've been to us or love us because they want to come see us. I wasn't, I didn't think that having 200,000 followers where you only talk to two was was the solution either. So it's fostering an actual family um, that I I remember their stays, our team remembers their stays, we engage with them as their friends, we send postcards, um, we, you know, we know the names of their dogs and their kids and all those other things. So I think for me, it was just kind of, I wanted a really honest, slow reflection and just let it organically grow um, without begging by using trendy words and terms and hashtags. It was like, I, I'm not that sophisticated. I gotta. I'm more busy with petting your dog today than making an Instagram post. Yeah, and 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 what I think is important to emphasize is that everything is aligned here in terms of you've gone for the you know the high touch point hospitality. You want to make people feel welcome, and that's rep that that that's represented in the marketing as well. It's not just oh we'll do this strategy here and this strategy there. It's very very well aligned, um, and and the 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 kind of warm hospitality approach seems to be working amazingly well for you and you know it's on the opposite end of the spectrum to the kind of we'll leave you alone getaway model which also you know can be very very effective as well but it's nice to speak to someone who's on the opposite end of the spectrum um this might that might be the best decision you made as a glamping business owner to 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 take that approach it may be something else so the question i was going to ask is what's the best decision you've made whilst operating a glamping business so the best decision um that i've made is to grow the business organically. To start where, when I said I was going to do something, like if I was gonna build it, I could afford, I could manage it on my own, wasn't that I could handle it. Um, that I understood that if I didn't have to have a linen service company, if you know, I didn't have, I built it in a way that I could learn it and really understand it before I put financial burden on my family and others, which then just naturally make it not as fun. You know, if, if you're constantly worrying about, I can't get this room flipped in time. I, I have no understanding of the area. I don't, I don't know if a client's going to show up a customer today who is in a Ferrari or in a Yugo. Those are old cars, but um, I, if I didn't really say to myself, I'm going to do this slow and methodically, I'm going to really make it clear who the client is. I'm going to really make it clear what the service is. And I'm going to really make sure that I build it in a way that I'm not so leveraged financially that I can't make the best decision for the business because I have to make the best decision for a bank, which those two sometimes do not align. I don't think I would have been as successful. And then when I was in a position of power, meaning I could make this decision because I could afford to make this decision. And I'll give an example. Um, uh, if anybody's wondering, what does she even mean? So um, we open up the first season. It is like hottest like hottest summer on record and we don't have air conditioning units like didn't of course we were over budget on everything but didn't have air conditioning units but I did go okay well listen 
I have a reservation that's paid. I can go buy one air conditioning unit at a time. Like I can buy one and then I'll buy the next one and then I'll buy the next one. And instead of I'll just buy them all and put it on a credit card and woo, we'll figure it out another day. It was like, no, you can't figure it out another day because another day you're going to be figuring out something else. So you get to do one step at a time versus a hundred steps won't make it. Yeah, it's what um, we, we interviewed uh, Zach Boozer Cruz from Behind the Stays podcast, where he interviews all kinds of unique short term rental operators. And um, his kind of main um, finding, I suppose, from interviewing one of those people is, is it's important to obsess over the model first and then worry about expansion because if you go too hard too soon then you're not gonna you're not gonna kind of iron out all the creases and it's just not gonna go well whereas that approach that you've taken is you've learned the, the business you've lived it every single day you've improved it bit by bit and then you know eventually it's unrecognizable unrecognizable from day one without almost you know without even realizing it almost and i think that's definitely the way to go yeah and i think it's or it's recognizable but in like you said but improved it's like yeah um, our guests, it was so funny because they'll say like, I was here in year one and I remember when this building was just screens and now it's, you know, a conditioned space. And, and it was like, I didn't want you to change it then. And then when you change it, actually it's better. And so I think that that's the thing too. It's like, um, and then also realizing where you're capped, you know, we get caught up in this more is more is more. And yesterday I was listening to a podcast where there was a woman who was, um, meeting with a coach and, and anybody that thinks more is more, this is for you. So the coach sat her down and said, well, what are you thinking? And she has, a, her business is $6 million in revenue. And she said, um, I want to grow it to a hundred million dollars. And he goes, well, why? And she goes, because I, um, you know, people told me I couldn't run a, I couldn't do this business anyway. And he goes, I want you to Google how many women founders are in the $6 million revenue category. She types it up and it's like 0.012 you know, less than 1%. He goes, you've made it. Like I, <laughs> like, it's like, how much more do you need? And I think that there's this other part too. It's like, well, we can put in 40 more sites for what? More headache, more complexity. Irene, I think sometimes when you, when you look at um, a glamping business's website or Instagram or whatever, you can see uh, why it's successful. And I think to a degree that that's true for the fields, but sometimes you only realize when you actually speak to the operator behind them, you see the standards that they uphold and the grit they have and the, the kind of, you know, ability to say, fuck it, we're going to do it. Um, I, I think that's when you really see, okay, that's why that business is operating on that level. And I think that's, that's very much the case for you in the field. So, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Is there anything you want to ask of the audience or if they want to get in touch, how'd they get in touch with you? Yeah. So I've always tried to be the open book with, you can always call me or email me, mm -hmm. you know, and I respond as much as I can. I think, um, I'll start with this. I, I will always pick up the phone when I can. I'll always respond when I can. Sometimes you have to send it twice. But mostly, you know, there's other aspects of getting lots of answers, questions. And I, I'll throw a plug to the American Glamping Association. Um, they're doing two, three really great things. One of them is they have some experts. You can sign up on a calendar, which then puts it on our calendars and really devotes time to any specific questions that you have. And I just tell everybody, for the sake of your time, just come with a list of questions or pre-send them. So that way, just like you pre-send questions, they're prepared to answer them. The next thing is, is that they're starting that glamping university. Did you see that where they're going to have kind of a certification, which says you've gone through some classes. You did a financial class. You did a, a zoning class. You did, which makes some of the tools easier. And then the third one is, again, if you want to get in touch with me, I literally put my email on the website. So when it says, be my friend, and you click on it, it literally comes to me. Um, so I, uh, I, I love, I love sharing. I love talking clearly. I don't have a problem with that part, but I mm -hmm. also, um, if there's a specific task that somebody's trying to get through, I'm happy to do it, but I'm also a little bit of a no holds bar. Like that makes no, absolute no sense. You're not, you should not be doing that. You, this is like, you're going to be literally flushing money down a toilet find something else like this. <laughs> there's five other operators next to you and they all have vacancies. Like they're not sold out and you want to open up another one. No, you're not doing that. That's like, nope. Okay, well, if you want to get a grilling from Irene, then we'll put the the link to the website in the uh, in the in the description. You can go and find the uh, the link to to chat with her. But Irene, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm sure we'll be having you on when you have your fiftieth site opened. You got uh, it. Mark, <laughs> Mark, 
five years from now, 50. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> but yeah. Until then, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. You got it. Talk soon. Bye.